Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Nyaledi Hanwana. I'm a program officer at the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the third installment of the Foundation's uh, Gender-Based Violence Speaker Series. Uh, we have a fantastic conversation around sex work and whether legitimization actually mitigates the violence that we see um, against sex workers around the world. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation examines the enduring and urgent problems of violence. Through basic and applied research, we aim to understand the causes, manifestation, and control of violence. And we spread this knowledge to inform policy, practice, and the public and public discourse, and of course, to advance scholarship. So drawing from the foundation's vast pool of scholars and grantees, as well as those within our networks, speakers discuss timely research and analysis of situations of violence, including war, crime, terrorism, intimate relationships, climate instability, and political extremism. As I mentioned, this session is the third of three such conversations which center on gender-based violence in its various forms. And while this conversation will predominantly focus on violence against cis women and girls, there is a plethora of research on how GBV manifests in and impacts the lives of cis men and boys and those in the LGBTQI plus communities. So our hope is that this is an informative space, that it leads to knowledge sharing, and we therefore encourage you to pose your questions and your comments in the uh, Q&A function of this Zoom webinar, or that you can share relevant resources should you wish to using the chat function. Um, we will also be using the chat function to share relevant resources as well as the bios of our three speakers today. So before we get into the program, um, allow me to run through this session's agenda. Uh, we'll begin today with a moderated discussion that will take us to the end of the hour. During the conversation, we encourage you to pose questions, um, raise comments, anything that you would like the speakers to uh, to speak to, essentially, because then at the end of that moderated discussion, we'll have about 25 to 30 minutes of a Q&A um, so that we can bring in your own perspective, your own questions to, to our speakers. Um, we'll hope to end right at 30 minutes past the uh, second hour here. And um, of course, this discussion will be recorded and it will be made available on hfg.org. So at this time, I would like to invite the speakers to please turn on their video as I briefly introduce them. So I would like to introduce uh, Claudia Torres Patino, uh, who is an SG, SJD and a Mexican lawyer currently serving as an Equal Justice Works Fellow at the Employment Unit of Greater Boston Legal Services. In this role, she provides assistance to BIPOC workers who have faced work-related crimes. Her SJD dissertation, In Harm's Way, Value, Order, and Legitimate Punishment in Two Mexico City Street Sex Markets, was an ethnographic study that delved into the informal labor organization and legal strategies employed by street-based sex workers in Mexico City. Michelle Decker uh, is a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where she directs the Center for Global Women's Health and Gender Equity. Dr. Decker's applied research portfolio centers on gender-based violence, including epidemi epidemi excuse me, epidemiology, determinants, prevention, and response strategies with support from NIH, CDC, the National Institutes of Justice, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. She works in close partnership with pract practitioners and communities most affected, including sex worker communities in Sub-Saharan Africa, South and Southeast Asia, as well as Russia. And finally, our third speaker, Modupe Animashon, is a PhD candidate with the Institute of Peace, Security, and Humanitarian Studies at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. She is at the end stage of her thesis titled Commercial Sex Workers and Gender-Based Violence in Communities Along the Benin Republic and Nigeria Border Corridor. Her research interests intersect sexuality, violence, female vulnerability in violent prone communities, and especially within the border space and human trafficking for sexual purposes and identity construction. 
Um, thank you, each of you, for joining us today. I'm incredibly, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I think um, it's a really, it's an important topic and, and really um, a great way that we can sort of end our uh, sort of three-part conversation about the various types of gender-based violence that um, that exists, that continue to, to plague the, you know, to plague um, not only women, but those who are uh, gender minorities and those who are most marginalized and vulnerable. So uh, welcome to you all. And I think I'll start with a, with a broad question. Um, and I'd like each of you to, to introduce yourselves, to talk a little bit more about the regions and locales where, where you work and the core questions that drive your research. So Michelle, why don't I go ahead and start with you? Oh, absolutely. I'm I'm so honored to be in this space. And I just, Nalati and team, I, I really just want to thank you for lifting up the topic of gender-based violence against sex workers. They are often sort of falling out of broader conversations on GBV. And in reality, there's a lot of shared knowledge across these two spaces. Um, just to share a bit of my background and sort of the values that I came in with, um, I came into public health um, after a stint as a sexual violence victim advocate, fielding hospital calls and helping survivors um, give police reports and forensic exams. And that's actually where I saw um, front, uh, up close and personal some of the issues around marginalization for sex workers and the ways in which they're marginalized by health systems and police systems. So really brought that to the fore. Um, and then, of course, now at Hopkins, um, in my role, really leading uh, survivor partnered research and evaluation on the scope of GBV um, against sex workers and others, and the ways in which we can use some of the learning from the broader GBV community to advance health and human rights for this population. So thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Modupe, I'll come to you. Please do give us an introduction, the region and locales where you work, and the driving questions of your research. Thank you. All right. So my name is Modupe Anima Shaun, as you rightly said. I'm from University of Ibadan. And um, I'm, I work on, uh, along the um, border corridors um, along Nigeria and Benin Republic. So my work tries to inter um, take a focus on commercial sex workers, particularly in border co um, communities, and how they're able to navigate um, the border space. Now we know that sex work, commercial sex work is a criminalized activity in many parts of Africa, Nigeria particularly. So you, we find that there are a lot of um, works that um, interrogate how sex work is viewed and how uh, they experience violence. But my work tries to uh, move the discourse from um, the urban spaces, the, the, pop, the, the, the cities in, in Nigeria, to a more volatile community, which uh, the border space is um, identified as by in literature and um, several works. So my work tries to understand how this specific nature features of border dynamics of border affect sex work, how the border serve as a pull factor to sex workers because they try to come to the border in order to avoid um, 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 security, to avoid um, legal um, scrutiny and so they come to the border community which is like a no man's land however they are they are uh, further faced with a lot of issues issues around um, militarization of the border and how it affects the sex workers issues around irregular migration transnationality and the border and um, human trafficking some of these uh, some of these uh, factors put sex workers that that are at the border into more uh, risk. However, they're able to navigate it, and this is what my work tries to um, interrogate. Excellent, thank you so much, Modupe. And Claudia, please, I'll come to you. Absolutely, so hi all, and uh, thank you, Naledi, for the invite. I am thrilled to join this conversation, and I hope like people in the audience can find it as uh, interesting and engaging as it is for me, and certainly for Michelle and Modupe. Um, so I recently got my SJD degree, which is the equivalent of a PhD in law. And in that capacity, I research street-based sex workers, informal labor organization. So my research question was, how are street-based sex workers in two neighborhoods in Mexico City 
um, how are they informally using the legal rules and the legal system? And I found out that they use the law, but also interpersonal violence to enforce internal discipline in their workplace. Even though one could think, well, I think that for some people it's hard to think on sex workers as active users of the legal system. And I think that the key takeaway in the Mexico City's case is that sex work has been de facto decriminalized since at least 2004 and formally decriminalized since 2019. Um, I think that like played a huge role in like making these um, women active users of the legal system. I know that we are not centering uh, today in policy, right? Uh, but I am I am a lawyer and I, I am of course biased. So I'm happy to be joined by Michelle and Modupe because Certainly, they are going to like correct me if I say like something wrong or I just missed that. But um, happy to be here. Thank you, thank you, Claudia. And I think, I mean, just on that on that last point, I think you're right. This is going to be an expansive conversation that will look at um, sort of the uh, the policy drivers that have really shaped the conversation around how we respond to not only sex work legitimization but the violence that sex workers face. But I would like to start actually by taking a step back and and situating this conversation a little more broadly. So, I'll, Michelle, I'll come to you because, as we know, right, violence against sex workers and indeed gender-based violence more broadly doesn't occur in a vacuum, right? It's part of a broad of broader social norms that relegate specific roles for women um, and gender minorities within society. And as we've talked about previously, sort of uh, societies in which violence against or harm against um, women and these gender minorities is, is expected and accepted, right? So how do we how do we account for that? How do we think about this when it comes to violence prevention, right, um, for, for sex workers in particular? Absolutely. Thank you so much for that lens. I think, you know, anytime we're talking about sex work, um, we really do need to step back and look at the policy climate, the social normative climate, and the, the economic spaces. And theory tells us that, and, and our lived experiences tell us that as well. So when we're talking about gender systems, um, we really need to be mindful of the normative environment that stratifies or separates the labor sector um, in terms of gender assignment and labor roles. And so you see that contributing to how sex work occurs, and you also see that element normalizing violence within that space. You also need to take a look at the gender wage gap, for example, that is driving the economic elements. And that's not only for female sex workers, but it's for trans populations and men as well that are wind up in sex work is there's this economic gradient um, that is contributing to the marginalization and enabling violence. And then of course you have norms that tolerate violence and it tolerates violence specifically for specific types of people, right? Um, and so we really need to be able to understand that and also really lift that up in our mobilization communi communication programs so that we can tackle it head on and understand that it's part of that normative envi environment that fuels violence. Um, and it also fuels violence with impunity, meaning that, you know, hopefully we've prevented violence. If we haven't prevented, we want to quickly mitigate impact and we want to be able to hold survivors, um, hold, hold uh, perpetrators accountable. All of those social policy, economic and normative factors are influencing the perpetration. They're also barriers to social support services for survivors and they're making it a lot harder to get access to justice. And we can hear a lot more about that, I think, from Claudia and from Madupe, but wanted to lay out some of that thinking on the social determinants that really bring us to the space. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. And I'd like to just stay with you for just, just a moment um, and just talk a little bit about what, why, why do we sort of see this, um, this, uh, 
emphasis, right, on the policy implications when we know, right, and much of your research has shown that there are all of these other mediums, right, as you talk about the social, the economic, and especially the um, the access to justice, right, that you touch upon for, for survivors. We know that there are other things that can happen right now that can help um, the sex workers in, in vulnerable situations. So why do we con consistently see policy as the, as the, you know, the driving sort of narrative on how to how to deal not only with this industry, but with the violence within it. These are such important questions really to be grappling with because, you know, globally the solution or the policy response, the dominant policy response globally around sex work has been criminalization in the policy environment. And it's really important. Um, and we're gonna hear, I know from Madupe and from Claudia about what this looks like in practice. And so it always is one of the first things that comes up is the policy environment as it relates to sex work. Um, and it is really important because it's a barrier to accessing justice, it's a barrier to accessing social support services as well. When we step back, we need to really acknowledge a few things. Number one, violence against sex workers is profoundly high everywhere in the world that it has been studied. And that is our work here at Hopkins and it is work around the world. Every single place we've been, the, the numbers are astronomical to the point where we're looking at our results and we're thinking, oh my gosh, is there an error here? It is really, really, really incredibly high. It is chronic, it is severe. Um, and what a lot of people don't appreciate, it's perpetrated not only by state actors, not only by police, people in sex work are experiencing partner violence. They're experiencing violence from paying partners um, and sort of a broader variety of perpetrators. So when we think about how to respond to this and prevent, we need to make sure that sex workers are able to access our IPV support services, for example, and that they're not excluded. We need to make sure that they feel comfortable and confident and will be well-received and well-treated seeking support for more general rape crisis services that may be available. These vary from place to place, and we, I think we all know that. But I do argue that one of the most actionable steps for us as a community um, is really making sure that sex workers are part of the picture in terms of accessing services and social supports. By that, I mean reducing the barriers to um, accessing services and making sure that where we have IPV supports, where we have sexual violence supports, that we actually do that outreach um, and we make sure that those pathways exist. They're not perfect um, and they're not as available as they need to be around the world, but it is such an actionable step in terms of mitigating those barriers. And it's something that we can really do even across policy environments and we've seen that. Um, so I, I wanna just make sure that we get an opportunity to really think on those actionable solutions um, because these are things that can happen today. Policy change takes some time. Um, that's part of why we're here today. But even while we're chipping away at that, making those services accessible is something concrete that we can be part of every single day. Absolutely, thank you, Michelle. And Claudia, I see your hand is raised, which is great because I'd like to come to you next. But if you'd like to respond to what Michelle's just raised, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think that I would just like to like add the legal perspective here because I agree uh, with Michelle that law and policy are very limited. And we sometimes think of the law, um, we usually think about the law or policy as like Salvadoran tools, but they actually are very limited. And in the case, like as it comes to the law and policy, I think that they are limited because one, once they get out there in the social world, uh, they acquire kind of life on their own and they start to deviate from their intended purpose, um, no matter how well intended. So there are always going to be unintended consequences. And I think, and this is where I kind of built on, um, on what uh, Michelle was saying, because I think that it's important to look at the social context, right? And for sex workers in particular, it tends to be, it's not always the case, but it tends to be a very tough social context, like um, informed by poverty and systemic trauma. Uh, so it's a, it's a difficult context. And criminal law in particular, I think that the moment you have a legal provision, prohibition, sorry, out there, there will always be someone trying to use it strategically. 
And then you expose those whose behaviors are criminalized to attacks. And sometimes those attacks are arbitrary. Uh, so say then, if you criminalize sex work, then you will have police officers threatening sex workers with arrest and requesting a blowjob in exchange for forbearance, right? Um, and for sex workers, again, and in my experience with street sex workers in particular, like this happens at disproportionate rates. And well, from another point of view, um, criminalizations, as Michelle was saying, like limits the accessibility to benefits and the enforceability of rights. Um, police officers refuse to take reports. Family courts give child custody to partners who, um, who are not quote, quote, criminals. Um, so yeah, like criminalization, I think makes it harder to like address the social context of these people. And it's very affected by it. So I think that's kind of inherent to the law and policy. And sometimes we just forget about that. Absolutely. Thank you for, for that perspective. And Modup, I see your, your hand is raised and I'll, I'll come to you in just a moment. But Claudia, I would like to stay with you for just a minute because exactly the um, the climate you've described, right, is, is much of what you've seen in your own research in the streets of, of Mexico City. So would you talk to us a little bit about how that how those policies and how laws are are complicated and what the lived experience is of the sex workers that you engaged with in, in Mexico City. Would you talk to us a bit about the violence that you saw? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that primarily we have like a lot of and like street based sex workers were super concerned about violence uh, from customers, from other actors in the street, like street vendors, but also like organized crime and Mexico City used to be like organized crime was not as present as evident as it is now so I think that was a huge concern and I think that is still an open question how they are going to address that because the truth is that most sex workers in Mexico City are not organized so it's hard like it, it, it just like individual sex workers reporting like abuse and it's them against like a whole network of organized crime it's just top like and they get they get very exposed so that's uh violence like across different groups or, or violence coming from groups outside the community of sex workers but in my research something that i was very interested in is in how uh sex workers inflicted physical and also verbal violence among each other. What was very interesting to me was seeing that this kind of violence was regulated and it was most often used to enforce the rules in their workplace. So it, 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 it was violence, but violence of a different nature. It was like very limited. And sex workers, for example, say they had like this norm of um, each worker had a spot in the street and they were very like jealous of like they, they wouldn't share that space right um an invasion of that space was a violation of their customary norms um so they would like kind of defend their places through verbal confrontation perhaps a beating um or filing a formal complaint to like discipline transgressors but it was interesting because the beating would be super mild like never they would never kill anyone like out of a beating um, and often the formal complaints were filed but were abandoned in the end so there was violence but it was I would say mild whereas the violence from dangerous customers or the organized crime that was a different thing and they didn't have like the rules or the authorities you know, like they didn't have like these community institutions to deal with that kind of violence. So it was the job of the state officials to put an end on that violence. And that just complicated everything because like, you know, like the state is like understaffed, like there was a lot of stigma and also this long history of distrust um, between sex workers and the state. So it just got like more complex. Um, but yeah, that's what I saw. 
Thank you. Thank you for fleshing that out for us. I'd like to, there's so many ways to go, right, based just off of what you've, what you've outlined, but I'd like to stay for a moment on this topic of sort of the targeted and strategic ways that violence is used sort of within um, uh, the industry, if we can call it that, within sex worker communities. Modupe, I know that you saw something similar, right, on the Benin-Nigeria border um, in the various kinds of violence that the sex workers in those sort of interstitial and liminal spaces um, are, are suffering. Can you speak to us a bit about that and about your work more broadly? Uh, all right. So, you know, um, Violence across board are similar in the sense that we have the popular um, um, narrative of violence, uh, physical violence, psychological violence, um, verbal. So this cuts across many communities. So as it happens in Nigeria, it happens in Mexico and, and other places. But specifically to my um, um, space, what I found very interesting and very new um, was how um, sex workers experience violence as um, as a corrective measure, if I would say that, by community, where communities in the border com border areas, particularly two communities, Shaki and um, Idiroko uh, communities, would stigmatize and abuse and beat up sex workers as a way to correct them, as a way to reinforce the ideology of um, morals or ideology of um, tradition like they would usually would say you find that there are communities where they they, they they pride themselves to be islamic and so when they see sex workers in those communities they they try to, they beat them and they, they do they, 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 they do not re, they do not identify this as violence as far as they are concerned they are trying to ensure that these women these deviant women are um, uh, are able to conform to the rules and the traditions of the community. Another very important I, um, type of violence I found in my community is how um, sex workers face extreme violence from spiritualists. You find sex workers in their bid to um, seek alternative form of protection against the popular form of violence, violences by the state actors, violences by uh, community members, that, and particularly violences that threaten their life, you know? We find, and I, I'm gonna tie this to the conversation that Michelle um, spoke about when, when she talked about policies, you know? The truth about the fact that policies are important, but in some communities, in some particular violences that I have seen, policies may have little to do with it. it. It may not be able to solve it. For example, spiritual violence that sex workers in my community talk about. We find, you find out that sex workers are able or have found ways to navigate around state um, um, violence, navigate around spousal violence and all that. But they are scared and they, are, they, they still grapple with the fear of being kidnapped, the fear of, um, of ritual, of ritual killings which is a very common reality, the day-to-day -day reality of many sex workers across Nigeria, but more so our other communities where, like I said earlier, it's like a no man's land. So sex workers have become easy targets. You know, they've become um, 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 the sets of vulnerable people, people who, if these things happen to them, people would not talk much about it. Because at the end of it, they would say, well, you cost it. You shouldn't have been doing this. So these kinds of violences are those ones I'm interested in. And I think even as much as these are the real, actual reality, policies do not have um, a grasp of and do not understand how to solve it. But these are the issues that sex workers in, my in the community I study are most concerned about. Thank you, Modupe, for that for that outline. And I think you you highlight something incredibly important that we'll delve into in this conversation. Right, is the intersectionality. Right, is there's particular violence that seemingly is because of the industry that these workers are in, but there are all of these other ways in which they are also vulnerable. And how do we how can we think about policies that align and look at look at you know context specifically, and also look at the sort of the person right holistically. Uh, Michelle, I see that you've raised your hand here, and if you'd like to respond to to what's come up in Modupe's response, uh, Modupe's comments, please feel free. Yeah, thank you. I I just really wanted to echo. I think Modupe's comments, especially around the normative environment and the violence that is used against 
men and women when they transgress those social norms um, is definitely one of the drivers that we see. And then as community members and leaders in the space, we're also really listening for the ways in which we hear people being dehumanized as a way to excuse and justify violence against people and justify the impunity and the lack of access or value of support services in this population. So one of the most useful strategies that has been happening globally for decades is this community mobilization to really bring people together and give voice to sex worker populations um, has been a very potent tool for all kinds of things, um, access to banking, access to credit, access to um, health services. And it's a really important strategy for violence as well, because that that silence, you know, violence really thrives on silence and thrives on, ooh, people aren't worthy and people in a dominance community can get behind that. And so when we hear and directly respond um, to those offers of dehumanizing people because of their involvement in sex work, that becomes something incredibly actionable through community mobilization strategies. Um, and I just really wanted to lift that up because I don't see it as ancillary at all. I see um, from what you're saying and from your community as well, just this really important strategy that we have to respond to that directly and, and reset those norms. Thanks, Michelle. Violence thrives on silence. I mean, that's that's just so powerful. And um, I think if if I were a hashtagging person, something that I would absolutely hashtag um, in terms of encapsulating, you know, what we're what we're getting at with this conversation. Um, and I'd like to stay on that point. Actually, I mean, I'll come to to you, Michelle, but I'll open it up to to Claudia and Modupe as well. Do we have examples of that kind of community mobilization that you're talking about? Where has this you know, is this working in a way that that is complementary to um, existing policies or is it working independently of that? And so I'll, I'll open that up to you, Michelle, but uh, Modupe and Claudia, if you have examples, please do share those. Can I go ahead? Yes, okay. Modupe, please. All right. So in my community, we have, um, uh, well, be because um, the community where I study sex work is um, is majorly ignored in, in, in a sense by even the states and um, the state personnel in the community. So we find that sex workers are able to galvanize more, are able to form a community, even though it is not um, a formal community. And you also find that there are, com there are uh, um, NGOs, you know, bodies within the border community that try to look out for sex workers. And I think that is very important. And that is one of the advantages that sex workers in the border communities where I study, but specifically the semi-border community, which is arguably the biggest border community along the West African um, border corridor. So we find NGOs, um, uh, organizations that try to look out for them, try to um, be like, the people that you can talk to when there are issues because they can't they can't assess state and they can't you know they, they don't have a voice so these people try these uh, communities try to talk to them and try to um solve issues when there are issues um that have occurred so i find that a lot of community try to complement um the policies that are, are available there are policies actually that protect women in nigeria However, these policies are not targeted towards commercial sex workers. And you know, like we, uh, because it is also a criminalized activity, uh, the, 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 the interventions are usually done subtly. It is not uh, quite there in the open, it's done subtly, one to one kind of intervention. And I think it's very um, um, positive, it's yielding positive. Uh, uh, impact on the sex workers and their susceptibility to violence. Thanks, Modupe. Claudia, please do jump in. I see your hand is raised. Uh, yeah, thank you. Now I'm trying to figure out how to uh, lower my hand there. Okay, yeah, so I would just like to add two things. And well, several things because I am also reacting to what I'm seeing in the chat. 
So first, I think that Michel can like give us like some examples of um, how legalization and le legitimization of sex work can impact violence. I think that actually her research is about that specifically, I think. Um, but also I would like to underscore that there's no one size fits all um, policy or measure that we can just go and implement. So even if there are some policies or laws or interventions that work for one setting, that doesn't mean that they will have the same impact on different settings. Uh, so that said, in Mexico City, what we had is there was like this huge mobilization around 2004, and it was a mobilization that was kind of facilitated by um, feminist activists and scholars uh, who literally like went to do some outreach and start to like talk to sex workers about uh, their rights as workers, as humans, right? About like human, human rights sessions. And they were very successful in negotiating with the government a de facto decriminalization. So even though there was an, an offense, like an, there was an offense uh, for soliciting, even, even this, well, despite the offense, like the police kind of stopped bothering them and stopped harassing them. And that was just like the result of negotiation, not a legal change. Um, so, and then, nonprofits kind of follow up on that because I think that another mistake that we often do is we think we make like legal changes like we like advance legal reforms and then just we, we, for, we for, forget them. Um, I know that the system is kind of designed in that way that the legislator just put it out there like a reform and then doesn't follow up and I think that in that sense, like nonprofits have been like more um, careful to like document and report like the impacts of like policy changes. And well, that's that's an example um, of mobilization and organization. And also like nonprofits have been like in 2014, I think. Uh, several nonprofits and sex workers um, try to um, process uh, something that in Mexico would be like self-employment certificates, like mariachis or street vendors, like people who are independent but, but working on the street, like they would have like these certificates just to, it's, it's like a permit to work in the street. So sex workers uh, got that. And um, the magic of those certificates is that they were not mandatory. So it was just a voluntary permit that you would have. So you didn't create like this difference between legal and illegal sex work. And I think that no one imagined like the impact of those certificates because first I, I could observe that the certificates empowered individual sex workers to kind of bargain with police officers for the use of the space, which was kind of a thing. Because again, like at that point, sex work was still formally criminalized. So it was huge. Like they were kind of, no, you can't arrest me because I have my certificate. Um, and like the police were like, ah, I'm panicking. And also I think like the certificates helped sex workers to um, access emergency assistance during COVID. And that was something like amazing because without the certificate, like they wouldn't have been able to get that assistance that was intended for workers only. So yeah, um, that's it. And on the question about why men like look for sex work, uh, commercial sex instead of other things, like there's a bunch of literature about um, about that. Uh, I think that there's not enough, but there are some, and I am happy to share if, like, uh, I, I can just give you my email and you can just text me and I can share that. Excellent. Thank you so much, Claudia. And thank you for, for giving us that, that example, some of the creativity, right? Especially that um, the creativity and some of the innovation that's coming out of the, out of the global South, right? To deal with, with, these, uh, with this issue in a context specific way. Michelle, I see your hand is raised, so please go ahead. <laughs> 
Oh, I, I really just appreciated um, Claudia's notes, especially on um, the certificates and some of the ways that, you know, when we think about the legal environment or the policy environment, you've got the criminalization and then you've got sort of the the regulated kind of piece. And I want it. And I think we heard just now from Claudia that there are some strengths and also some gaps in that. So on the one hand, some of these can be really empowering and sort of um, allow purpose. Um, and then in some places where we've seen this, and this really came up in our human rights review that we did a couple of years ago, is you can wind up with sort of this, this bifurcated system where some people get the certificates because, and they could be expensive, they can be access issues, it becomes a tool of extortion um, at its worst. And then you don't see any protection for people that haven't been able to get that. And that might be as a result of a lot of intersecting vulnerabilities um, um, citizenship issues or other kinds of paperwork issues. And so I want us, as we really think about this legalization and legitimization conversation, to really push ourselves, and this is really for our audience as well, we need to be thinking about this with a lot of nuance um, and not sort of make assumptions about a single, a single solution. One of the other things that we um, uncovered in our review are some, this is actually through the, some of the CEDA um, shadow reports, is you know groups that were advocating for um, tolerance zones finally got that legislation passed and then the implementation fell short, right? So the zones were never specified. And then there was no way to show whether I was in a zone or not in a zone. And so that's sort of where the letter of the law and the practice of the law fails in protecting sex workers from violence. Um, and we also saw examples as well where even in decriminalized or legal regulated environments, there was still a substantial amount of abuse happening. And so I raise those issues, not to say that we've failed entirely as a community, to, but to push ourselves against thinking about this as a single solution, one size fits all. The policy change is an important component of this, um, but in order to really actualize this, in order to really see the benefit on violence reduction, we need a supportive social environment and we need to work on those other elements as well. We'll shortchange ourselves and we'll shortchange sex workers if it becomes only about the criminalization piece. And I'm not advocating against it. I just want us to be really clear on what it can do and what it kind of what it can't just yet. Um, I wanna make sure we get to hear from Adupe on this as well. Thanks so much, Michelle, and and absolutely, I think, but and you've raised sort of a the the next point or another point in the wrinkle in the conversation that I wanted to get to, right? Because we have talked in this conversation about sort of the various strands within the um, the policy options that we see, but you know there is you know more and more the push for decriminalization. The sort of main example that we have of this and working um, in any in any real way comes from New Zealand and your review uh, uh, that we'll make sure to share on our on our website and. Um, along with this video when this is when this is made public, um, I think deals with this really well. And so if you would, for our audience, just outline what decriminalization looks like, how it's worked, and maybe how it's how it can be improved upon specifically with the with the New Zealand example. Yeah, absolutely. Just just I think and I'm, I'm seeing in the chat, I know a lot of folks are, are a little bit more up on this, but this is really moving against the criminalization and allowing sex work to be occurring in all of the other um, all of the other ways that it that it might be occurring. Um, and it is really lifting um, a system that has been punitive and has been overly regulatory um, and allowing sex work to exist. Um, and this is often on ground, it, it is often on grounds of human rights. It is on grounds of safety. Um, and sometimes it's also on grounds of public health when we think about um, disease control and prevention and um, infectious disease in particular. Um, and so we've seen, you know, in New Zealand is probably the most um, you know, the, the, the most sought or the most sort of referred to example here within this. And there've been other smaller jurisdictions around the world as well, where we've seen these efforts take place. Um, and a question that often comes up is like, is violence, are people safer? Is there less infectious disease? A challenge within that is that because we actually sought to do that in our review as well. Um, and a big challenge in this is that we don't have enough examples of true decrim 
in order to really compare that and to, to really kind of look at that. Um, and, also, and as well, we have examples still of some persistent violence, even in decriminalized environments. And that's sort of my cautionary note on this. Um, so as we start to move forward, I think, you know, our ability to understand what this really looks like is looking at the policy writ large, but also as implemented, um, and then really doing that higher scale, like that more rigorous evaluation to look at safety outcomes, access to justice, access to social services, um, and really be talking to people, not just interviews, but in a more quantitative way to really understand the changes that we can see through a policy or through a practice change. Thanks. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And Modupe, I would like to come to you. Of course, you're welcome to respond to anything that's come up thus far, but I would like, especially from your, um, from your particular context, to think about sort of how do we begin to bring in, especially in, situa in, in spaces or, or rather in, in regions in which some of the other options are less available, um, to sex workers, how do we be, think about bringing in their own perspective on how they would counter some of the violence they see, especially those um, that are facing greater vulnerability or marginalization specifically due to um, due to their location. Right. So who are some of those who are some of those potential allies? Is it, you know, community, religious, traditional leaders? Are there CSOs and NGOs that are that are operating in, in the border regions that you're that you're looking at? How do we sort of get to speak getting directly, you know, speaking directly or hearing directly rather from sex workers themselves as to what works to, you know, to lessen that the vulnerability that they um, that they experience? Well, there, there, there are a couple of um, um, representation, you know, and those representation also try to um, privilege or try to um, focus on the voices of sex workers. In Nigeria, we have a, an association for sex workers. It is not a formal association, but it is quite popular, and they, they, they have an office and all that. And so they run um, periodic um, programs to make people know that, okay, we are here and we do ABC. So we have a lot of activists too. But I think um, the, the, most, the most important uh, medium for me would be research. Researchers, activists, and non-governmental organizations that are involved that are trying to understand what uh, the sex work um, environment is and try to um, focus on the voices, the ideas that sex workers themselves are trying to bring forth. And this is also tying close to the, to the issue of uh, policy we're talking about. Now, um, policies, the policies usually policies in Africa and particularly in Nigeria is based on knowledge from the global, the global, the global north. We find that most of our policies are based on this knowledge. The, 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 the knowledge base that we have in Nigeria from researchers and from activists is not so out there. So because of that, it does not take into cognizance the actual context of sex work and violence that sex workers experience. You know, so I, I think if we have more researchers, if we have more NGOs who come who um, try to put the voices of sex workers as the focus, I think most of uh, it, it will help the sex workers to have to bring to have their ideas brought forth uh, into to, to the to the public fair. Yeah. Thanks, Modupo. Thanks for that thought. And I'm looking, I know that we're getting to the end of the hour here, and I want to make sure that we leave time for uh, questions and, and the number of comments that are coming in from the audience. And I'd also like to ensure that Michelle has an opportunity to, to respond to some of that, given that unfortunately she will have to leave us um, at the at the end of the hour here and won't be able to join us for the Q&A. Um, but I think before before we do move to to the audience questions, I'd like to just stay more duper with what you raised at the end there and ask you all as researchers, what are sort of what are the questions that haven't been asked, right? What are next steps that you see for research to take on this issue um, from where each of you sit? So, so Claudia, I'll come to you and then Michelle to you and Modupa will will end with you before opening it up for uh, to questions from the audience. Absolutely, thank you. 
Well, I think, and this is true for me and the context I study, but I am sure as uh, we were talking about yesterday that it doesn't need to be true in other contexts. But I think that a more granular distinction of how violence of what's violence and how it looks and who perpetrates it and whether it's mild, severe, like a differentiation of violence, I think that it would be very helpful just because it would allow us to prioritize intervention, to be more aware of what kind of long-term and short-term interventions we can actually need, that we actually need. Um, so yeah, I would advocate for that. And this is something that I tried to do in my dissertation, but I think that is uh, much more needed. Though that said, I also think that research like as it is done today, and this is connected with a question on positionality that I saw in the chat and was addressed to me. I think that is always kind of problematic. I always felt that I was kind of getting information from sex workers and not being able to give them back anything and that's that might not be true for all researchers but that's something that i that hold held true for me in particular so i also think that research is kind of inherently limiting like you either do research and stay in your office and teach and all the kind of things that go with like a with like the legal path, legal the academic path, sorry, or you go to the ground and help the communities. You can try to do both, but it's quite demanding. So yeah, that would like we also need like a systemic change in um, academia in order to kind of better achieve the goals of research and really help the communities. Thank you, thank you, Claudia. Michelle, please go ahead. Thank you so much. I just, I'm like typing in the chat, Claudia, you need to come over to Hopkins because our work is very applied in terms of having connectivity with communities to surface the most important issues and really, br and also it's a two-way street. We're doing a lot of data literacy and bringing results back and saying what, you know, what is, what, what does this look like? What does this mean for you? And even even early days, what are the important indicators? What do we need? To, what questions need to be asked of this situation so that we can advocate for the right, you know, policy changes and the right programmatic solutions, um, and really understand the most relevant evidence sources. I think that's really where this disconnect often comes: is researchers are asking questions that are, don't matter to communities. Um, and so, anyway, look forward to seeing a touch on that. Um, on the research side, you know, I, I I have personally, I mean, this is our you know one of our bread and butter here at Hopkins in terms of figuring out what is the most important. And I think the things that are really coming to the fore for me for this population certainly is what's working on prevention. How do we prevent violence? If we haven't prevented, I we really need to understand and start to track like more short-term and medium-term outcomes of success. What does what do I mean by that? I want to know that stigma is being lowered around GBV specifically for sex workers. I want to know that if we haven't prevented violence, we've mitigated the health impact. I want to know that people are increasingly able to and are comfortable accessing support services, making a police report. Maybe they need to bring a friend, but they know how to do that. That gives me a lot of assurance that, yep, maybe we haven't gotten all the way where we need to be on prevention, but we are creating an enabling environment for survivors. And I say this because there are a lot of survivors out there. Um, and so we need to be able to think on multiple planes and, and not sacrifice the immediate needs of survivors um, for our broader goals of prevention, which are always going to be in place. Um, and when I think about this, it's 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 not easy, but it's simple. It is actually simple. Um, and there are ways and methods that we have honed and others have as well to work really closely with communities on really surfacing what are the most important indicators, what do we need to know locally on the policy side, and how are we going to use this information to strengthen at the very local level these support services and networks. 
Um, so those are a few of the research priorities that I think I want to want to leave you with today. Um, and actually, just while I have the floor, I do want to say just a huge thank you, um, Nailati and and team. It's been such a pleasure to be part of this conversation. And I apologize, I've got to scoot off for a student uh, review session. So thank you again, and look forward to continuing this conversation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for your invaluable um, uh, commentary and and. Um, uh, in what you've brought to this conversation, truly, thank you so much. So we'll we'll let you we'll let you jump off here at the top of the hour. But Modupe, I'd like to to come to you and ask you, right? What are what are some of the uh, research priorities that you have, and sort of what's next, right? In terms of what research needs to look at. All right, I I have a couple, and it may look like I'm bringing us back a little. Um, in in Nigeria, we still have this um, argument on adopting the word sex work. And that's because I'm, I'm trying to take us somewhere. You know, if we are not sure, do we adopt the term sex workers or we know that these are not prostitutes because of the because of some sort of agency that they that they um they express. But we are we, we aren't sure are there sex workers, are there so uh, are there um those who are involved in survivalist sex as a survivalist um activity. And so this brings me to the to the linkages of um, um, from so from many of our, uh, the participants I've had encountered with the linkages of um, domestic um, domestic labor, you know, um, domestic labor and trafficking for domestic purposes, um, sex work as a continuum. So I'm I'm, I'm really looking forward to um, researches that try to trace. Um, the, 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 like a chain, it's, it seemed like it's a chain. Um, children or young ladies come in as, as um, domestic helps into border communities. And also because take note, border communities is, is an entry and an exit point for human trafficking. So there is this, um, there is this um, um, issue of human, tra uh, human trafficking for sexual and for domestic reasons. And so there's a the chain starting from people coming in as um, domestic help and at the extreme of the chain, which is sex work. So I, I would like to see how we uh, look at that, that, that intersection and that uh, continuum. I would also like to see how sex workers, particularly um, we take note of the fact that the sex workers I, inter, uh, I study are, are based in a community that is known as, um, that, is, that really thrives on illicit economy. And in Nigeria, sex work is still identified as an illicit economy. So how do sex workers, uh, how do they navigate amongst other illicit economics and, and how does their, the, the gendered identity affect this intersection? This is some of the things that my thesis tries to interrogate, but I would like to see it done in more, more uh, in, in depth. I'm also interested in thinking of how sex workers, I think uh, Michelle made, made this uh, point when she was talking about uh, violence. What is violence? How is violence defined by sex workers? We understand what violence is according to global definitions and in policies, in researches and all that, but what is violence to sex workers? How do they, which violence is, because we find, I find that a lot of sex workers have this in there, uh, they do their compartmentalized violence, their great violence. So, for example, a sex worker would say, "I would rather, um, I'd rather be beaten than to be an easy prey for ritual killing." For example, I'd rather have um, a spiritually, sexually um, um, harassment. They don't even know it as harassment anyway. I'd rather have that than have this. So how the grade violence, those are some of the interesting um, indices or nuances that I would like for that um, study to, to interrogate. Thank you. Thanks, Modupe. Thanks for outlining those. I think you're you're absolutely right. I mean, these are we didn't we didn't get in into it so much in this conversation, but exactly as as Claudia raised, right, is the importance of how we define how we define violence, the language that's used. I think some of what you touch upon is also the importance of what's happening at the international so at the international level in terms of what's being 
what is the agenda that's being set and how is it being described and discussed globally and then what is the uh what are the realities on the ground if you will right i think you also talk touched on um the importance of of migration right and especially in this in the spaces and the locations in which both you and claudia are working right what is the role that migration plays and so of course we could continue this conversation for many hours to unpack some of this but i i do want to make sure that we get to some audience questions here in the final uh 20 25 minutes that we have left i would like to first just um thank so many of the comments we're seeing um people from around the world working in the us the uk um india and and farther afield, um, letting us know some of the, the um, work that's happening, um, specifically around decriminalization. So thank you to those of you who have shared this um, this information. Um, but I'll, I'll turn now to some of the, the questions that we're seeing here, and I'll start with one from David Wildermuth, um, who who notes that um, without any knowledge on the on the issue, he's wondering if there are studies that show a relationship between the legality of sex work and violence directed towards workers. So Claudia, maybe we'll pose that question to you and then Modupe, if you'd like to jump in on that, feel free. But Claudia, would you like to talk to David's question? Uh, yeah, I think, oh. I don't know if the goal of the question was like to get, I don't know, like papers or references, like pointing out to the upsides of legalization. I, I don't really know many of those, but that's why I was saying that probably Michelle um, would be like the best uh, person to answer that question. I don't know if we can follow up on that with her. Because in my case, I have I have read and those were the citations I use. Like I read a lot of ethnography, and ethnographic work is always so like granular, and in terms of like coming with a policy solution, like it it kind of it falls short. Not because ethnography is not great, but because like it just don't produce like very clear. Um, yeah, solutions again, I don't know how to say it, but um, so I think that in general, in general, and it depends a lot in uh, like on the context you are like doing research, um, but I think that legalization, as we were saying right at the beginning of the of the of the meeting, what criminalization does is it kind of disables workers from looking for solutions, especially solutions that are provided by the state. They cannot enforce their rights, at court at least. What legalization does is kind of the opposite, unless it is as strict as, and Michelle pointed that out like earlier, that she was saying sometimes when you over-regulate sex work, you end up with like two groups, one of which has access to to like all the um, legal benefits that come with legalization, another group that just cannot like afford legalization because it's expensive, because it's like very um, standardized, and they just cannot feel the like the uh, the mold, so they just fall through the through the cracks, um, and that's something that is not good either. So I would say. legalization allows like i think like more access to benefits and to like possibilities to enforce rights but it depends on also how it is like crafted not all the forms of legalization are like the same and some of them can have like very um very bad outcomes for for sex workers. Um, in the case of Mexico City, we haven't been able to legalize sex work. It was just like what I was talking about earlier, like sex work self-employment certificates. They are very like limited, like there's no registration of sex workers, there's no mandatory like inspections, which I celebrate. I think that it, that's a good thing. But it like the, the certificates in themselves like allow strict 
sex workers to like stand on the street and to get access to medical benefits and to like during COVID um, emergency assistance. So I think that even if that's not legalization, like it has like open possibilities to sex workers in Mexico City at least. So I would say like we need to stay like open and be creative and not think of legalization again as a one size fits all and uh, a silver bullet. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. And I think there's a question here um, really around around research that I'd like to pose to each of you um, by that's come to us from Melaku Tekla. I hope I'm I'm stating that correctly. Um, but I'd like to pose I know, uh, Claudia, you spoke a little bit to this right about how exactly you conducted your your ethnographic work in Mexico City. Um, again, taking into consideration sort of the the ethics and your own positionality. So if you'd like to expand upon on that you're, um, you know, I, I welcome you to do so. But Modupe, I'd like to pose that question to you as well, right? How is it that you are able to um, to think about the ethics and the position and your own positionality when engaging with these with these sex workers and how it is exactly that you that you carried out, right? Your your own research um, on that on the in the borders. So I don't know. Like I'm very curious about what uh, Modupe has to say. Because in my case, it was very clear that I was like this white woman. Like, I mean, in the US, I would be considered like a Hispanic, so not exactly white. But back in Mexico, I am kind of in the white group. So it's it's weird. But yeah, I could like feel like this huge difference between me and the sex workers who collaborated with my research. And it was... A, a real challenge and something that I had to discuss with my uh, supervisor because at some point like sex workers were inviting me to do sex work myself kind of to legitimize myself uh, to their eyes and I thought that like they they I mean they wanted to test me right um, for very good reasons like they wanted to see if I was willing to give it like my privilege and be there with them in the street. Like in the end, we decided not to do it. Like we, my, my supervisor and I decided not to go through that path, but something that I really committed to was staying in the ground. And when COVID hit, like I wouldn't, I, I didn't leave them. I was like there with them, standing on the streets, like mobilizing, like trying to get grocery kits for them. And I think, that's how I try to kind of balance uh, my position, my position as a researcher who was not willing to do sex work <laughs> uh, in the field, but who on the other hand was like very um, committed with the community and trying to like help them as much as I could uh, at that moment. And also like, I'm very happy to say that many of those women like ended up being my friends and I am still in contact with them and I'm going to visit them soon and I'm very excited about that. And yeah, Modupe, I think that you should like talk yeah. about your own experience, which I think is super like different from mine. Well, my, my privilege, my um, privilege came, came, came out immediately. Can you hear me? Yes, Modupe, go ahead, yeah. yes. So it was clear from the onset that I was um, different because maybe I didn't have enough um, orientation before I got to the field at, at the initial stage. So as I got to the field at the, at the, first, the first few days and weeks, um, I was not very welcome to have conversation. And that was mainly because um, I, th I think this, uh, the, my participants were more comfortable having conversation with my research assistant, who is, who is male. I guess um, maybe gender issues and all that. And so, and also maybe I didn't go in to actually relate with them. When I, immediately I realized that I moved the conversation from the brothers to somewhere less um, formal, somewhere less, more um, relaxing. So we, we, there, were, there were times I would go to the field and would not have any conversation on, my, on, on the question, on the research itself. We just have conversation on what they do, how they do, what they do, their 
problems and they were at that point were eager to tell me this is what i'm going through this is what are the problems i i face this is how i think um, um your research can help put my voice out there and also i think i should mention the fact that i i i used an ngo as my as a gate um a gatekeeper and it's immediately it made it quite easy for me because many of the of the members of the ngos were sex workers who now work for the ngo so they they have uh, they know they have a way they have they had ways to assess sex workers the sex workers trusted them and um, by session also trusted myself and my team that got to the to the field so initially it was not easy to penetrate but as i began to um you know try to um not emphasize the fact that i'm a researcher i'm from the university and to hear your stories i just want to understand what really you are going through and what are the things that you would like people to to know they began to trust me and it was um almost smooth going for, for, forward Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you for that um, sort of that deep dive right into the work uh, to the work that you carried out. Um, I would like to back up and I'll take um, I'll take my right sort of as the uh, moderator here. I'd like to back up because we've spoken about we've spoken about and Michelle sort of led us in a in a conversation around the alternatives to the policy responses. Um, and we've talked about the various um, actors and stakeholders, if you will. But this is a conversation that is being, you know, being put on by a foundation. Um, and so I'd like to get from each of you an understanding of what do you think funders and donors roles are in this right in this uh, uh, response, not only to supporting survivors, but into furthering prevention efforts. So um, Modupe, I'll stay with you and, and get that re reaction from you and then Claudia come to you. I think funders should still emphasize on research, especially because in Nigeria, um, research is research as at now is still at a very it's not at, at an advanced level you find that a lot of researchers are still talking about sex work as a moral issue do you understand sex work as uh you know as an exploitation you know as a, a single narrative of the voiceless victim uh woman who has no agency and all that and so as as founders push for more researches and push to especially empirical researches, the researches that go to ground zero to understand these nuances. I think those are important things that um, funders should pay attention to. And I would also say that maybe we should also find a way to take our researches um, out of um, the universities to, to, the, to, to, to the community. So whereby doing a sort of uptake, research uptake. So even after you've done these researches, what, what are the benefits of this? Um, important data to sex workers. What is the benefit of what I know now to sex workers? Because I may not be able to get to um, the state as I now, but how do I find little ways to make the lives of sex workers in Semeboda better? How do I begin to uh, maybe collaborate with the NGOs at the, at the border and through them also have inter uh, intervention programs with the community to make this, the life of sex workers and people are within that industry. How, how do we make their life better? So it shouldn't end at writing papers and researching. It should also continue to actual intervention, actual impact. And I think those are some of the ways funders should concentrate uh, their efforts on. Thank you. Thanks, Modupe. Yeah, I think, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. And just to, before I let Claudia jump in here, I think on that point about who is your audience, right? Who are you writing for? Um, and, and hopefully part of what we're doing in this conversation, right, is, is bringing forth the research that you all have done um, and making sure that it's, that it's um, translated in some ways, that it's amplified in other ways so that people beyond the academy can also um, engage, right? So Claudia, please, I'd love to hear from you on this. No, absolutely. I think that this is so true. Like, I cannot, like, as I am reading the chat and see, like, these comments about privilege and how, like, only women were represented in this panel, I think it's true. 
I think it's true that uh, perhaps sex workers should have been invited to this. Um, but you know, like this is a work in progress. Like I thought about inviting some of my friends, unfortunately, well, they would like to remain anonymous for one thing, for another thing, there are some uh, language barriers and we didn't have the time to like figure that out, unfortunately, but I like for donors and sponsors, what I can think of is try to make these spaces like more available to people in the ground. And I think that's important. Like try to bridge that gap between privileged researchers as ourselves and people who are there and who participate in this research, but trying to, um, because they, they know also that we have access to spaces that they usually cannot access and that's like it's not like they allow us to be their spoke women or spoke men or whatever it's that's not the case but it's like if you can have access to those spaces then you go and speak like give your position uh but yeah remind where you are coming from right and that you are not speaking for ourselves we have our own voice so i would say just resonating with um, Modupe was saying, I think that more intervention, not just abstract research could be very helpful. Also, I think there should be like more follow up on intervention and research. And well, I'm very happy, like honestly, and I'm very grateful to the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation because like when I applied, I was kind of scared. I was like, I am talking about sex work and I have kind of this in unconventional perspective. So they will probably reject me, but they didn't. So I am very grateful because this is a space in which I think I can speak freely and openly and transparently. And that's something that I really appreciate. Like, so please like keep on like supporting this kind of research. Um, and also intervention. So if you can actually do both and try to like support research that has impact on the ground, I think that would be ideal. Absolutely, thank you. And I know that we've got just about 10 minutes left here um, and there's so many, there's so much reaction coming from from the uh, from the audience, so thank you to those of you who have who have stayed with us to the very end and who are sort of amplifying and celebrating uh, much of what Modupe and Claudia and of course Michelle shared earlier. And I would like to take just a step back in these final ten minutes, if we could, um, and think about as Michelle started talking about before she uh, before she jumped off here is is looking at sort of examples and maybe listening to some of you uh, listening to you talk about what are some of the short term and immediate solutions solutions right that you know that Michelle has uh, Michelle touched on earlier in the conversation around responding to survivors have you seen that in action in each of your in each of your contexts and if you could give us those those examples and then what do you see you know sort of coupling with the conversation we've just had around research as some of the long-term solutions right how do you see some of that happening are there examples of that again from your from your particular uh, context and research research that you've done are there others right that you've that you've seen and that you're familiar with so breaking down the conversation a little bit into some of the short term the medium term and the long term um, uh, strategies that are that are needed um, so why don't I go modupe to you um, and we can sort of talk about what you've seen as sort of some of the the short term strategies that have been effective um, and what you see some of the long term strategies are that are needed sort of beyond uh, the research that you've outlined. All right. Well, thank you. So for short um, term strategies, I think um, um, emphasis should be on uh, community um, collaboration and um, where sex workers form community of themselves, you know, first initially, then uh, maybe extending now to the community where they um, work, you know, so have community little uh, community where they can provide help and this happened a lot in other communities where i work remember it's a it's a very community-based space so we find that um sex work sex workers some of them do not live in the brother but have rooms everywhere in, in the community but they find way to always meet 
you know, to to try to warn each other, this is happening, this this could happen, try to avo uh, avoid this space, try to, you know, so that they, they've, they've already formed um, communities that within themselves. And I think that should be encouraged and that uh, one should encourage such. Then again, NGOs, I, I, I we can't um, emphasize it well enough, NGOs, uh, is, uh, the, the work they do in terms of intervention, even as regards um, uh, access to health, access to to health, access to, for example, the, the NGO I worked with um, were the ones that would provide, whenever we go to visit sex workers, that would provide condoms, provide um, lubricants, provide, you know, different medications and aid and encourage them to come to the office if there, there is need for them. So such um, NGOs should uh, um, work in on the short um, term base. But at, for the long term, I think policies we would have to go back to policies. However, these policies must uh, be based on the reality on ground. For example, policies in Nigeria must take cognizance of the reality of sex work activity and violence in Nigeria. So if that is done, it's a long term, it won't happen in the next <clears throat> one, two years, but it's gradually um, policies would would probably would hopefully impacts on you know states uh, mechanisms, state state uh, personnel who are also identified as uh, one of the perpetrators of uh, violence against sex workers, maybe it affect, I mean impacts them positively and uh, it will trickle down to the to, to the community as a long term. It may not happen immediately, but as we keep working uh, uh, along these lines, uh, it will happen finally. Thanks, Modupe. And, and for you, Claudia, as we close out here, some of the, the short term uh, successes, perhaps, that you've seen, and then the uh, long term, uh, long term tools, let's say, that are that are still needed. It's very funny, because I, I just can't, I, in the context of Mexico City, again, I perceive that community mobilization was harder than actually like legal reform. Like in some senses, I think that in Mexico City, uh, legalization has been like kind of discussed several times. It just cannot like, it just doesn't have like enough like support like in the end. So it just like kind of gets always to the point of being an initiative, but never like going through the whole, um, way and being passed as law so it's true that some legal reforms are difficult but there are some others that are kind of simpler and that can be like done right away and especially i think there is a momentum right now like i just heard that this past june street soliciting i think was decriminalized in maine here in the us and i think that there are two other bills that are going to be discussed in Massachusetts and New York. So it seems that the, the, this might be a moment in which we can expect that sex work might be decriminalized. And I think that's for the short term kind of a step forward. And I think that many groups that cannot agree on many things about commercial sex can actually compromise and just like agree that the criminalization is a good short term um, strategy, let's call it that way. Um, I think also that alliances that in the short term, alliances with groups that have already done like a lot of work, such as um, community organizers or, well, in the case of Mexico City, for example, like street vendors, um, but also LGBT communities. Um, I think that alliances between sex workers and those groups would be like very beneficial uh, just in terms of starting to organize. Because as I said, like at least in Mexico City, mobilization has proved hard for many reasons. So that would be like, a first step again and in the long run then I, I would try to like have like a cultural change 
um, I would love to have like, yeah, like more awareness about how sex workers like live and what they are going through, but I don't know if like to get it to the point of being a cultural change, that's gonna take some time. Perhaps today we can just start like making work to like raise awareness. Um, but yeah, that's gonna take a while. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. We are in our final sort of our final two minutes here. Um, and I just I would like to thank, you know, once again, Claudia uh, Torres Patino and Modupe Animashon and of course, Michelle Decker, Decker for leading us in such a rich conversation. Um, you know, as I often say at the end of these sessions, this conversation could have gone for for many more hours and, and probably deserved that. Um, but I think this discussion really underscored the particular marginalization that sex workers face, right? The importance of humanizing them globally um, and thinking about the particular um, uh, risks and vulnerability that they that they encounter in local, you know, in local realities, right? In in the uh, context specific regions that you both have outlined and that Michelle spoke to, and then of course thinking through. Uh, the prevention uh, prevention tools as well as other tools for survivors of violence that can be implemented now right talking about short term and long term strategy strategies. Um, you know the foundation is we, we fund research on on violence specifically to facilitate. Um, uh, you know, a deeper understanding of the nature and the causes of violence and how we can mitigate it. And so this really is a space where we um, we put research at the fore. We bring researchers to to discuss this important this uh, important important discoveries, right, of the of the work that you've undertaken. So we we are incredibly grateful for you giving your time and sharing your expertise with us. Um, so I do now have the duty of bringing us to a close um, and thanking not only today's speakers, but all who participated in this three part series. This video, along with a summary of the discussions and questions for further research on all of the, uh, the three conversations that we've had in this gender based violence series will be made available on HFG.org and it will be shared with each of you in the coming in the coming weeks. Um, as always, we ask that you please follow HFG on our social media platform platforms for more information about our 2024 slate of knowledge against violence speaker series sessions, um, but other events, publications, grant and funding opportunities. You can follow us on Twitter at HF Guggenheim and on Facebook and LinkedIn at Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation. Thank you all and we hope to see you in the next installment in the new year of the knowledge against violence speaker series. Thank you so much.